You have a lot of children here. That's great to see. As uh, Elizabeth interviewed us about uh, our time in New Zealand, there's a number of things we took away from New Zealand. In fact, we didn't want to leave your country. But uh, my wife's mum got sick and so uh, she needed some help. So we, we, we left. But uh, I remember, I think it was in this very church where we had a seminar on how to run prophecy seminars. And that's one thing I've taken away that's been of tremendous use over the years. The second thing was how to run small groups. I remember we had a program for about a week and a half down at Longburn College. And that was just a, a tremendous help, how to run small groups. And the other one, of course, was, as I mentioned, I became a public evangelist right here in, in Auckland. We worked in the Taranaki and in the Hawke's Bay and had a marvellous time. One of our daughters is actually born in Napier. So we get to be Kiwi somehow. <laughs> I tell you what, we've run a couple of campaigns here the last few years. One was in Christchurch. And we were blessed by that back in 2013. The same year, um, early that year, a young lady and her husband, he, she's Indian, she was baptised. Uh, we ran a campaign in Suva back in 95 and, and Ramina became, was converted from Hinduism to, to Christianity. And uh, she became a minister of the gospel and married a Pakistani young fellow, whom I might call Osama for obvious reasons. <laughs> but they're a great couple working together in, uh, in Vicargal. And they said to me in the beginning of 2013, they said, Pastor, would you come and run an evangelistic crusade down here in Invercargill? I said, I have no money left. Uh, I've already distributed for the year to other churches around the division and, and I have no time left. Uh, all my time is taken up during the weeks now. It's all booked up. They said, would you, would you have a few weekends? So I looked on my calendar and I found five weekends. They said, OK, this is what we're going to do. We're going to fly you from Sydney to Christchurch to Invercargill every week for five weekends. And that's what they did. <laughs> they were so keen to have the gospel preached in their area. That church has had about 100 bap people baptised in the last four or five years. It was amazing. And we saw God's hand down there in Invercargill. It was wonderful to see his hand. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, may the Spirit of God bless us this morning. Father, blow like the wind. Burn like a fire in our hearts. Convict us, convert us, and consecrate us to the work of our God. In Jesus' name, amen. We are running an evangelistic series, as you heard next year, called Ancient Mysteries Revealed the Future. This was the series we actually ran in Invercargill. Um, this begins in June next year, goes for about a month. And we'll be bringing 13 evangelists from both New Zealand and Australia here to Auckland. And we'll talk about that a little bit this afternoon. And you'll be welcome to join us. The last time we did this, we run a field school every five years for Australia and New Zealand. Last time we did it in Adelaide. And uh, the Lord blessed. The time before that, it was in Melbourne with Mark Finlay. And so this time it's, it's here in, in Auckland. And we're thrilled about that. But I want to just share with you a couple of reasons why we're doing that as we move into our sermon this morning. I'll put it on the screen here. Notice these words from the Apostle Paul. But God forbid, he says, that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. There is nothing more powerful than the gospel of Jesus Christ than to change and transform a life. This is no question about it. You know, the greatest need in your city here, your country, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can make political adjustments and do things, but it's the gospel that will change your heart. 
That's why Ellen White wrote these words, and I want you to notice them very carefully. She says, A great work is to be accomplished in setting before men, that means men and women, the saving truths of the gospel. Notice what she says about the gospel and its truths that are connected with it. This is the means ordained by God to stem the tide of moral corruption. Now I ask you a question this morning. Is New Zealand becoming morally corrupt? Let me tell you it is. (laughs) Like Australia and the rest of the world today. In fact, I looked up on the internet. Just this morning, in fact, uh, because I wanted to check my facts. I've been telling people this. Do you know that, and forgive me for bringing this up perhaps, but New Zealand has the highest number of sexual partners for females on the whole planet right here. Just over 20 for New Zealand. I looked at that and I thought, wow, the men are only 16 in your country. The Aussies uh, are just a little bit lower in actual fact. But the highest is the Austrians, for men, 29 sexual partners in a lifetime. Now, that's just one statistic, but I hope it brings it home to us that morally we are going down the tubes, as we say. And we saw just yesterday that horrific terrorist attack there in, in France. Something is desperately needed in our world. The gospel can change society. That's what she says. She says this is his means of restoring his moral image in man. That's discipleship, isn't it? You know, if you don't believe those words, you think about what happened in England during the preaching of George Whitfield and John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Those men, when their lives were transformed and they found Christ or he found them, they stopped England from having a revolution like the French had. England would have had a bloodbath like happened in Paris and other places in France back in the late 1700s. And historians tell us it was because of the preaching of those men that changed society. Hence William Wilberforce becomes a believer and changed slavery and others. When the gospel takes root in a heart, it will be seen in society. It's New Zealand's greatest need today is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can transform society as well as save people eternally. She says it is his remedy for universal disorganization. It is the power that draws men together in unity. And then she utters these words which are very important to you and I today. Notice what she says. She says, as she continues, to present these truths, the truths of the gospel, this is the work of the third angel's message, which means the three of them together, summed up in the third. She says, the Lord designs that the presentation of this message, the gospel message in the context of those three angels, she says, this is to be the highest. What is greater than, higher than the highest? Well, there's nothing. This is, the, this is it, brothers and sisters. And the greatest work to be carried on in the world at this time. The world needs the gospel in the context of these three angels. And that's what we're going to be on about in this series coming up next year. They really are about those very things. All right, so join us this afternoon, if you would. Three o'clock, I think it is. This morning, ignited. Seven sure signs that Christ is soon to return. Sometimes it's good for us to step back and remind ourselves that the King is coming. There is no question about it this morning. And I just want to whiz through five of these and then zero in on the most important two. Number one, you, well, before we get to number one, you and I are God's lights in a dark world. Paul put it this way. He said that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, he says, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's our world. He says, among whom you shine as lights in a dark world. Isn't that great? 
We are to be those lights that shine the gospel of Jesus. And I like the way when Jesus called Paul on the road to Damascus, look what he said. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, he said, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive, he says, an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's our work. And this morning we want to talk about how to be ignited as God's lights. I'm sure you are already ignited, many of us, but some of us could bright, glow a little brighter perhaps. And I trust this morning that we might leave this place different than when we came in. Sign number one, it's a no-brainer. We've already talked about it. The, the, the world's moral decay, and we don't even need to go there, but except to remind us that when some of us grew up, I grew up in the city of Perth in Western Australia, and we used to sleep out on the, at the backyard in summer because it was 30-odd degrees at night. You wouldn't do that today if you've got any brains almost, would you? Not in a city like that. Not if you want to wake up next morning. In fact, 80-year-old women have to put two or three deadlocks in their, on their homes in some of the cities of Australia and New Zealand, lest a 13-year-old rape them. That has happened. Moral decay. Number two, Darwinian evolution. We don't have to think of this, but Peter gave a very cryptic statement. Cryptic statement in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, listen, as we near the end of time, people will mock the idea of both a flood and a creation by God. Now, you just stop and think. 200 years ago, almost every person believed in an idea of a creator God in Europe and America and Australia. Isn't that the case? Just study your history. Maybe you want to wind it back 300 years. But most people, even scientists, believed in some sort of a creator God. But today, in countries like yours and mine, come on, give me a break. You're trying to tell me that God made the world in six days when scientists tell us the opposite? My brothers and sisters, that should remind us, Peter said, in the last days, scoffers will come and willingly not believe those things. We are living in an interesting time when somebody's coming. Another third sign is of a revived papacy. Now, Seventh-day Adventists ought to be well aware of that one. John in the Revelation made it very plain. At a time, John had predicted that when... The world back in 1798 and the Bishop of Rome was taken prisoner to Valence in France. And people in those days said, this is the end of the papacy. John had said, no, there will be a revival, a renewed papacy in the end of time. Brothers and sisters, we're looking at it right in the face today. We are looking at those things today. I hope we're reading the book of Revelation. I hope we've got our eyes open. Brings us into another one. John said a fourth sign is the growing bond between Rome and Protestant United States of America. He makes that very plain in Revelation 13. Are we listening? Are we awake to the incredible signs that are taking place in the Protestant world? A couple of years ago, where we had the Bishop of Rome on his mobile phone sending a message to those Pentecostal pastors, a whole lot of them gathered. Well, tomorrow, <laughs> did you realise what's happening tomorrow? There in the United States of America, there will be together 2016, where Protestants are calling everybody together to come to help America focus on God. Well, I'm not against that. But who's showing up? If you have a look on the internet, maybe after the meeting this afternoon, who's showing up? for this great event. Hillsong United, Josh McDowell, you go on, and who else is going to be there? Pope is going to be sending a video message to this great gathering. Brothers and sisters, we need to be awake here. In fact, this is what the leader of this great movement that takes place tomorrow, where they hope to gather a million people right down there in Washington, D.C., 
He's an evangelist, Nick Hall, a young th fellow. He said, the organizers are humbled and honored that the Pope has agreed to be involved in this event. He went on to say that His Holiness, now, I mean, ex excuse me, I, I have respect for people, but this is a Protestant, the way he's speaking. Something is changing in our world, brothers and sisters. That His Holiness would choose to speak into this historic day is a testament to the urgency and the need for followers of Jesus to unite in prayer and in our, for our nation and our world. I have no problem with praying, but I'm just, I'm just raising a flag here. Something is taking place in our world and prophetically we are seeing a fulfillment. What about signs? The sign of the tremendous wonders movement today, miracles and healings and all of that sort of thing. We, we see it in the Church of Rome with the Marian apparitions and so on. We see it in the Protestant world with healings and prophecies and all those sorts of things. But we see it in the Islamic world today. We see it in the Hindu world today. We see it in the secular world today. With all of the emphasis on the supernatural. I tell you, brothers and sisters, revelation coming alive today. Somebody is coming again. And we need to know these things. I want to bring you at a sign now which is Seventh-day Adventists should help us to realize we're not going around in circles here. We're heading in a straight line, and that is the great prophecy of the 2,300 days. We're not going to go into it, but it makes it very plain that in 1844, the judgment actually began for this world. It's, it's on today. Well, I'm sure the Lord's taking a break on the Sabbath. But that's what the Bible teaches us. And how do we know those things? I'll tell you how we know those things. Because part of that prophecy is what we call the 490 year prophecy or the 70 weeks prophecy. And what's that about? That tells us that Jesus came on time and he died on time. It assures us. Uh, you know the prophecy, many of you. But listen. If 1844 is wrong, then Jesus did not come in 27 AD, but he did. And Jesus was not crucified on time in 31 AD, but he was. And Daniel shares that. And I have Jewish friends who have said, Jesus is the Christ because of that prophecy. One of them was a Russian man I dug with in the Middle East in Jordan, Alexander Bolotnikov, a Jewish, Russian Jewish man. And he heard this prophecy as a young man, uh, searching for his roots. And when he heard that, he said, Jesus is the Christ. Well, that prophecy is part of the bigger prophecy. Jesus is coming. We're not going in circles, brothers and sisters. This is one of the great signs that we're nearing the end. But the final one is the one I want to address this morning. And that is the proclamation of the gospel. Time magazine a few years ago ran an article and uh, basically what they said is Christians believe the words of Jesus. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then the end would come. Time magazine said if Christians believe that, they would realize that Jesus coming is nearer than they think. And then it outlined how the gospel was going to Africa and South America and even into today now. Since those times of that magazine article, it's even in the great country of India. One of the fastest growing places for Christianity today is, the, is India. Unbelievable, my brothers and sisters. We are nearing a time when the Lord Jesus is going to come. And I want us to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because you and I need to be ignited at such a time. The world desperately needs what you have to offer. You have the only solution not only to eternity, but to transformation of society. You don't think the Lord's interested in transforming society? Let me tell you, what do you think Jesus did when he did came here? Went around healing the sick and raising the dead. That's why I like the lesson this week that we had and we're having on social justice and all those sort of things. It's the gospel that can change society through you and I and our changed lives. That's part of it. Of course, we're heading for bigger things. We're heading for the end and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and eternity. God wants his people there. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul in verse 9 writes these words. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Do you notice what Paul says? There's one thing in life that we want to do, and that's to please Jesus. I long to please Jesus. I hope that's what you live for too, to be pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he gives a reason or one of the reasons, surprising reason, verse 10, because or for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it's good or evil. My brother, my sister this morning, I'm talking about these last two signs, and one of them is the judgment. Now, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, there is a judgment going on now, and you and I will be examined in that judgment. Every thought, word, and deed. Now, some people don't like this sort of talk, but let me tell you, the Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts us of what? Of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Because when we think about judgment, we think of what we're doing in our life. Isn't that the case? Now, we'll come to the good news, but first of all, we must front up, my brother and my sister this morning, to the great need of the world out there. Now, it's all right for you and I, when we have Jesus Christ and we are secure in him, we have nothing to fear. In fact, in the Bible, judgment is something God's people long for, because judgment means deliverance. So God's people have nothing to be afraid of for a number of reasons, one of which is the judge is, is Jesus himself. And that judge is also the lawyer. And if you've, the lawyer and the judge are the one person, you can't lose the case, can you? But not only that, the one who judges us and the one who is the lawyer, he's the one who took the punishment, was condemned for sin in our sin. What a beautiful thing for a Christian. But what about for those outside Jesus Christ? What about that? That's a different story. Come with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Oh, we need to be concerned for our world today. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're looking now at Hebrews 10. And I want you to turn to verse 29. Verse 26, sorry. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 26, Paul says in his discussion here of the beautiful thing that Jesus is our great high priest and so on. And then he says these words in verse 26, for if we go on sinning deliberately, meaning if we hold on to know and sin, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins. What's Paul saying here? He's saying this. If I'm holding on to sin and I won't give it to Jesus, don't play games. I cannot claim the blood of Jesus while I'm holding on to know and sin or not doing that which I know I should do. That's a fool's game, he's saying. And now he comes down to verse 29, verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, my brother and sister this morning, let me pause for a moment. If you and I this morning are playing games with God, we need to be understanding that, that one day we will have to face Jesus Christ himself. In fact, you know, some have asked this question, which some don't like, and that is, this, what if the judgment came to my name today? What about me? That's a serious question and a very important question and one that God's Spirit would have us to ask. Now, if we're in Jesus, not a problem. Joyful thing. But if I'm not, that's why Paul said the next words back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's turn back to 2 Corinthians 5. He said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But notice what he uttered next. Verse 11. Therefore, in view of the judgment, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the terror of the Lord, some translations. What do we do? We persuade men. My brother, my sister this morning, does the lostness of people out there, and maybe even in here, does it concern us 
It did Paul, it moved Paul to action. He said, what did he say? Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men and women and boys and girls. My brother and sister this morning, the lostness of the people of Auckland should concern us deeply. Or there's something wrong with our, our Christianity. It should trouble us and it should motivate us to do something. But it's not enough. We need more than anxiety about the lostness of people out there and the fact that they face the judgment of God. Something else drove Paul, but this was certainly one thing that he said was moving him. There was one other thing greater than that, and that's found in verse 14, and I want to turn our attention to that because that brings us to the other part of the, the gospel, the good news. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 5, verse 14, Paul says, as he comes to his great climax, he says, for the love of Christ compels us. It means it propelled him, it motivated him, it moved him to action. The love of Christ compels us. What did he mean? The love of Christ moves us to do something about the plight of the lost. What did he mean? Well, he meant, first of all, Christ's love for the lost moved him. How do we know that? Because he says these words, because we are convinced that one has died for all and all died. And then he repeats it in the next verse, and he died for all. My brother, my sister, we better believe that Jesus died for those people. Praise God for that. You know, Paul in the book of Ephesians talked about the dimensions of the love of God for people. He said the love of God is very deep. You know, where sin abounds, God's grace much more abounds, the Bible says. Now, I don't fathom that when here comes a father who sexually abuses his young daughter or a brother or an uncle. I don't get it when a terrorist drives a bus through a crowd of people just to kill people and shoots them as he goes. I don't understand that love. But the Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. There is no sin that you've done or that I've done or anyone has done that God is not able to forgive. That's the dimensions of the love of God. God's love is not just deeper. God's love is enormously long, meaning it's long suffering. Paul says, or Peter says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. I had a, well, my wife had an uncle. This uncle, if, he, if it wasn't bolted to the ground, he stole it. He had more women than Solomon almost. Well, not quite that many, but five wives and a few concubines at least, you know. <laughs> He was, he was, you know, you'd have to say he, and he was brought up as a Seventh-day Adventist, but at the age of 17, he left God and the church. And that's the life he lived. He was a lovable guy, a lovable rogue, you know what I mean? You get some people like that. But man, what a crook. He gets to 75 years of age, and God's spirit started to speak to him. Come home. Now, what's God going to get out of this? A 75-year-old man who's wasted his life, and at the end of his life, God calls him to come home. I tell you, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. My uncle, or my wife's uncle, wrestled for that for about 10 years, trying to, God could never forgive him his stuff, and finally he sunk into the arms of Jesus. I was to baptise him, and went was to go over and baptise him and he died during the week so we never got to, 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 to baptise him but he'll be in the kingdom because he'd made his acceptance, he'd accepted Jesus and was going to follow the Lord and was following him. My brother, my sister, God's love is long. It will chase us down. It will do all it can but God's love is incredibly wide, the Bible says, Paul says, it's wide. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whoever, now that word whoever in the Greek means everybody without exception. Anyone and everybody. And I sometimes look up into the starry heavens. How many stars can you count on a beautiful dark night? Well, you may get a couple of thousand if you're good sighted. But when the scientists look with their massive, powerful technology telescopes and so on, they continue to see more and more and more. They're up to 7 billion, 767 trillion zillion galaxies at the moment. Well, not quite that many. You know what I mean. There's a lot. The more they see, the more they find. It seems that space is almost infinite. But for God so loved one lost world. We would have said, forget it, man. Don't count your cost here. But not our God. One lost world. And he gave his son for this planet. But think about it. There are seven billion of us living on this planet today. Now, if you're a mathematician, one in a great number that almost seems infinite becomes what? A zero. A nothing. Now, you would think that God would say, well, what's the point here? Almost the whole seven billion don't love me. For God so loved the world, he gave his son for one lost soul in the whole universe. I don't understand that. But that is the incredible width of the love of God. Don't say, yeah, God does it for him, God does it for her. But he can't. Meister, you're wrong. I was sitting in a train station in Belgium at uh, Ostend on one occasion, about to catch a train to go to through Germany. It's freezing cold at night, frightfully cold. I was smoking inside the waiting room. So I didn't want to get smoked out, so I thought I'll stay out here in the cold, but it's December. It's freezing time in, in Europe. So after a while, it drove me into there, and I thought it's better to get the smoke and be warm than die out here freezing. <laughs> so I went inside, and, and I, I don't have too much um, flesh on my bones, and I tried to sleep on this wooden bench, but it was too hard for me, so about 4 o'clock in the morning, I gave up, and so I pulled my Bible out of my, my pocket, and I was starting to read and uh, spend some time with the Lord. And a young couple who were obviously not married came and sat right down beside me. And after a while, the guy, the guy says to me, you're a Christian, eh? I said, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. He was English speaking fellow. Hey, I'm a Christian. He said, I used to be a Christian too. I said, you used to be a Christian? Tell me, what went wrong? How come you're not a Christian now? So he told me the story. And at the end of the story, he said, I'm a lost man. God would never forgive me for what I've done. And I said, you're dead wrong, man. You are dead wrong. And I, of course, I told him the story of the prodigal son. You know what? After a while, tears started to flow down that young, lady's, uh, that young lady's eyes and the man started to brighten up. They realized that the love of God included them. Oh, my brother, my sister this morning, let me tell you, God's love for those people out there and in here is incredible. It's infinite. But the love of God is also very high, my brother and sister. It reached down right to the very center of the universe and God came off the throne and he became one of us. But more than that, says the Bible, he became obedient unto death, even the most horrible death where God in human flesh was naked on a cross. That's enormous love. So Paul says that love that God has for people, it moves us to action. But there's something else that drove the Apostle Paul than just God's love for people. This is what he says. Turn with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. Paul says, He died for all, that those who live, which means potentially all men died with Christ at the cross. Isn't that the case? That's what he said. Because he took all the sins of everybody and they died. But only those live who accept that. So he says that those of us who live, those of us who have accepted what he did and claim what he did, we no longer live for who? We no longer live for ourselves, but for him 
who died and rose again. My brother and sister this morning, what else drove the Apostle Paul, the love that he had for Jesus? That's what drove him to reach the lost people. Does your love for Jesus lead you to do that? It should. The love of Christ, our love for him. We no longer live for me and mine, but for him and his, his children. That's what drove the Apostle Paul. That's why he could say in verse 16, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. What's he mean? He means, no longer do I go down the street here in central Auckland and say, there goes a drunk. No, there goes a blood-bought man whom Christ died for. I no longer see somebody who's rich and I say, there goes a greedy monster. No, there goes a man or woman bought by the blood of Jesus. I see three people through different eyes, Paul says. I see them through the eyes of Christ. My brother, my sister this morning, how do we see people? How do we see our kids? How do we see our parents? How do we see our workmates? How do we see our neighbours? Do we see them through the eyes of Jesus? Oh God, I say, give me those eyes. I'm talking about Webster here. Give me those eyes of Jesus. One other thing Paul meant, and that's found in verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Meaning now the love of God is in here. And it's the love that Jesus has implanted him in him that drives him now. It's Christ's love in him. That's what else drove the Apostle Paul. Does the love of Jesus dwell in you, my brother, my sister, this morning? Is it there? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. What does he mean, the old has gone, the new has come? Well, one thing he means in the context is the old way of looking at people. The new way of looking at them has come. I travel a lot when we were living in Sydney on the train because we lived on the central coast and backwards and forwards, and it was... A tragedy thing to sit on that train station in Hornsby sometime and see a 25-year-old guy talking to himself out loud because he's lost his, his mind through drugs. There goes a blood-bought man. Not a piece of junk. Not a wreck of humanity. Yeah, maybe a wreck of humanity, but in God's eyes, Jesus loves him, of course. question should be for us now is this. Lord, how do I have those eyes? How do I have the heart for people who are lost? How do I get that? Let's close by going to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Paul tells us in three or four words, All this is from God. What he means is what he's been talking about. This way of seeing people, it only comes from God. You cannot manufacture a love for that father who's abused you. You can't cook that up yourself. You hate him. My mother and father were not Christians. They hardly knew who Jesus was when they grew up, when they were married and so on. They lived for two things. They lived for this weekend and next weekend, they said. Because this weekend they went to the party, they got drunk, and then on Sunday morning, they put their head in the toilet bowl to get over it all. And then everything between that weekend and the next weekend was a black hole until they came to the next weekend and they did it all over again. Some of you might have lived like that. Lots of people live like that. Party time begins Friday and it ends Monday morning when you've got to go to work. Without Christ, life is meaningless. Well, my parents lived like that. One day, my mother, who was working in a shirt factory, she saw a lady that she hadn't noticed before, and she said, what makes this lady tick? She, she has a happiness about her. There's a peace about this lady. She has a hope for the future. She has meaning and purpose in life. My mum said, I want that. I want what she's got. So she began to talk to this lady, who was a Methodist lady, and that lady led my mother to Jesus. And realised that it was Jesus that made the difference in this lady's life. So mum became a Christian. 
Well, up to that point in time, she used to lock my, my father out of the house often because he was often drunk. She would want to give him five of the very best. You know what we mean. And when Jesus came into her life, one of the first things he said to us, hey, listen, you locking that guy out of the house, stop that. That's not the way a Christian should act. So my mum hated that idea for a moment and she, she'd go to the door as angry as anything. She'd want to really give him the best ones and she would pray on this side of the door, oh God, help me to love the guy. <laughs> See, every time she prayed that prayer, the anger would just... And she'd open the door and welcome my dad home. Well, after a while, what's the guy going to think? What has got into this lady? <laughs> no more five of these anymore. So, you know, my dad is... One day up in Carnarvon in northwest of Western Australia there, he worked for Telecom, did a lot of travel. He's in the hotel there where he's staying. He's got his beer glass in one hand. He's got his cigarette in the other, puffing away. And a voice spoke to him in his head. Harvey, what are you doing with your life? Now it was inside his head and my dad knew that God is speaking. He thought about what was happening in my mother's life. And right there in that hotel he said, God, help me. And God came into his life right then. That's the last smoke he ever had and the last drink he ever took. Because there is power in the blood of the Jesus and the gospel to change your heart. My brother, my sister, the world needs you. The world needs us with Jesus in us. They are wanting something better. Many of them are hungry for something better. And what is it? He says, all this comes from God. We cannot cook that up. It's got to be the power of God. Well, how does it happen? As we close, look at verse 18. He says, God through Christ reconciled us to himself. And then he tells us how it is in the next verse. That is, I mean this, says Paul, Christ was, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself by not counting their sins against them. Well, who did he count them to? Verse 21. For our sake... He made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. That in him, when we're accept, we accept him, in him we become the righteousness of God. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when you know that you, all is well between you and God, you have something to say to the world. You are motivated because not only does God forgive you, not only does God justify you, count you as if you never sinned, but you are born again with the love of God implanted in your heart. That's what Jesus said. The moment a sinner accepts Christ, two things happen. He's pardoned. No more to doubt God's forgiving grace. And the second thing, he's a new person. New in Jesus with God's love planted in him. John Patton, that great missionary to the people of Vanuatu, was trying to understand a word for belief or faith to get across to the people of Vanuatu. He wrestled with that idea. What's the word I can use so they'll understand? He was visiting a home of a friend one day who was lying out in the beautiful Pacific sun. And he was just soaking it up. And Patton said, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, I'm just reclining. And Patton said, I've got my word, I've got my word. And when he translated John 3.16, this is how he put it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever reclines their whole weight on him will not perish. And you like that? My brother, sister, this morning, are you reclining your weight on Jesus? He's ready to take it. He wants to take it. All we need to do is say, Lord, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. And if we do that, we will change the world because of the spirit who's living in us. We're going to sing a beautiful hymn this morning, number 198. Let me tell you a little bit about the man who wrote that. Well, there were two brothers, John and Charles Wesley. Both of these men were ministers of the gospel in the Anglican church, but neither of them knew Christ. John Wesley, he wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to have Christ in his life. He wanted to know his sins were forgiven. And it was that day he slipped into the back of a church in Aldersgate Street or a little meeting room in London. And as he was seated there, someone shared the sort of words we've shared this morning about the gospel of Jesus. And Wesley said, I felt my heart strangely warm within me and I knew that God had forgiven me, even my sins. That man got off 
out of that church, got on his horse, rode 200,000 miles and changed a nation through the power of the gospel. His brother Charles was dying. He was a minister of the gospel. He didn't know Jesus and then he was on his deathbed. The gardener came to visit him and said, Charles, are you ready to die? Charles said, what do you mean? I'm a minister of the gospel. It's not good enough, said the gardener. What do you mean? I've tried hard. I mean, would you rob me of my best deeds? It's not good enough, Charles, he said. The gardener helped Charles to recline on Jesus alone, plus nothing. Charles Wesley wrote this hymn that we're going to sing this morning. It, it epitomises what takes place when you and I accept the Lord Jesus Christ and he moves inside. Not only justifying us, but forgiving us. What happens? We move outside to tell a lost world. Let's sing this beautiful song. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? It's really Charles Wesley's own experience of conversion. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn. bow together in prayer loving father in heaven our heads are bowed our eyes are closed we need to make a decision this morning with what you have shared with us from the word of God father there's a lost world out there maybe a lost world in our home in our school in our university where we are in our workplace Lord, this morning we, we see the love that Christ has for those people. And like John, who said, even so, Lord Jesus, come, our hearts cry that out. But we want more to have that same experience. Father, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you want to say to the Lord this morning, Lord, I want to recline all my weight on Jesus. I want to put my life in his hands, be used of him to change people. Just raise your hand this morning. Maybe you're, the first one that needs changing is your own heart. You tell the Lord that. Lord, change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever new. May the heartbeat of Jesus be in me. Father, you see our hands this morning. Time is running out for this world, Lord. May we reach people for Jesus. In his mighty, wonderful name, thank you for beginning with us 
in his name. Amen.